voice. A stranger they do not follow. And as your word goes forth, Father, you will open the eyes of our understanding. You will speak to our hearts the things that you want to speak. I hide myself behind the cross, knowing full well that it's nothing in me that I can do. It's only in what you have already done. And I give you the praise now and I give you the glory now. In Jesus' name and God's people said, amen, amen and amen. Well, we're beginning a new series this morning. We're going to see God's favor in the life of Queen Esther. Today's message title is very simple. If you study her life, you would find this to be so true. Nothing is impossible with God. I want you to say that with me. Nothing, Nothing. is impossible, impossible with God. Now let's say it once more. Nothing is impossible with God. Turn to that person beside you and say, did you get it? <laughs> okay. Let's turn to one portion of scripture that really sums up the story of Esther's life. And you'll find it in Proverbs 8, uh, verse 35, reading and teaching from the Amplified Version of the Bible. Amen. Proverbs 8, 35. For whosoever finds me, wisdom, finds life, and draws forth and obtains favor from the Lord. I'm going to say it again. For whosoever, can you say, I'm a whosoever? Whosoever finds me, and God's saying that means wisdom, finds life, and draws forth and obtains favor from the Lord. That was Esther's life. Esther had great favor with God. Now, in the scripture in 1 Corinthians 1.30, it says, it tells us, the Christians, that Christ was made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. The very first thing is wisdom. So, Esther had great favor because of the great wisdom that God gave her, and the church has great favor because Christ was made unto you wisdom. This is so important to get this, that you walk in God's favor. Whether you see it, feel it, taste it, whatever, you walk in God's favor. It is the finished work of Calvary. It's not something you can do to make this happen. It's already happened 2,000 years ago. That's why Jesus came, that you and I might have life and have it more abundantly, and that is favor. We don't need more life and more abundant when we get to heaven. It's complete then. It's here on this earth that we need God's favor. How many of you know what I'm trying to say? You hear me? It's now, and you need to appropriate that by faith. Hallelujah. So we begin our teaching here this morning. Nothing is impossible with God. It begins in the country of Persia. There lived a king named Ahasuerus and his wife, Queen Vashti. The Bible tells us that both of them on the same night decided to hold a banquet. In other words, we're going to party. Well, something happened. Vashti had her banquet with all of her, lady, her ladies, and the king, Ahasuerus, had his banquet, banquet with all of his men. And the king got quite drunk. And he wanted to show off the queen. Because if you study the life of Vashti, she was extremely beautiful. And he, she was one of the, the king's prizes. This was the queen. So the king sent for her. He said, send for me, send to me Vashti. I want to show her to all of my men. 
And that is where our story begins. Turn to Esther, the second chapter. Esther 2. We're going to read quite a few scriptures, 20 actually. Esther 2, verses 1 through 20. And I'm reading again from the Amplified Version of the Bible. Our story is beginning with this uh, happening. And this is exactly what the, the scripture tells us. That when King Ahasuerus called for Vashti, she refused to come. Wow. I would say she probably is one of the first women that ever thought about women's lib. All right? But it didn't pay, pay off for her. She refused to obey the king. Now, the court was thrown into an uproar. That's, that is really, I'm not even saying it. It was an uproar. No one could, could believe that Queen Vashti had done this. She literally made the headlines. And do you know what happens when, with the word of mouth? It spread through all the little towns and hamlets real quickly. And everyone, psh, 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 did you know what Vashti did? Do you believe what Vashti did? She said no to the king. Well, her disobedience cost her her royal estate, and she was removed. Chapter 2, verse 1. After these things, when the wrath of King Ahasuerus was pacified, he earnestly remembered Vashti and what she had done and what, she de and what was decreed against her. And then the king's servants who ministered to him said, let beautiful young virgins be sought for for the king. And let the king appoint of officers in all the provinces of his kingdom to gather all these beautiful young virgins to the capital in Shushan, to the harem under the custody of Haggai, the king's eunuch, who is in charge of the women, and let their, their things for purification be given them. Verse 4, and let the maiden who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. And this pleased the king, and he did so. I want you to note these words that I'm going to say now. There was a certain Jew. Uh, you can underscore that in your Bible because this is very important. Actually, what I'm saying here is God has always got a plan. There's always a certain man or a certain woman or a certain uh, Jew in this case. But God's hand, beloved, is always mapping out what's ahead for you. You can't see the whole picture, but he knows the picture. So we see here, let the maiden who pleases the Lord instead of Vashti, there was a certain Jew in the capital in Shushan whose name was Mordecai, son of Jaiah, Jaiah, the son of Shemaiah, the son of Kish, a Benjamite, who had been carried away from Jerusalem with the captives taken away with the Jeconiah king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried into exile. He, that's Mordecai, had bought, brought up or raised Hadashah, and that is another name for Esther. His uncle's daughter, for she had neither father nor mother. Now, we can say, well, I was born on the wrong side of the tracks, or I didn't have this, or I didn't have that, or I didn't have the right breaks in life. Well, this little girl was an orphan. That's how she started her life. The, but the maiden was beautiful and lovely. First of all, she, it says she had neither father nor mother. The maiden was beautiful and lovely. And when her father and mother died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. So God had his hand in Mordecai's life way back then when Esther, or Hadashai, was a very, very young child. So when the king's command and his decrees were proclaimed, and when many maidens were gathered in Shushan, the capital under the custody of Haggai, Esther also was taken to the king's house into the custody of Haggai, the keeper of the women. 
this was a eunuch, and all he ever did was take care of all of the harem to make sure these women were beautiful to be given to the, the king. That's it in a nutshell, really. Verse 9, and the maiden pleased him and obtained his favor. Notice that? She obtained this eunuch, the head man's favor. And he speedily gave her the things for her purification and a portion of food and the seven chosen maids to be given her from the king's palace. So as she's walking into this, beloved, and now she's given seven other women, <coughs> excuse me, who are going to help her to become as beautiful, if that's possible, because she was already a raving beauty. But these women were given charge of her to make sure she was the most beautiful thing this king ever seen. And he removed her and her maids to the best apartment in the harem. And Esther had not made known her nationality of her kindred. Watch these words. For Mordecai had charged her not to do so. In other words, keep quiet. The time will come when I'll tell you to open your mouth, but right now, don't. And Mordecai, who was an attendant in the king's court, walked every day before the court of the harem to learn how Esther was and what would be becoming of her. And verse 12, and now when the turn of each maiden came to go in to King Ahasuerus, after the regulations for the women who had been carried out for 12 months, since this was the regular period for their beauty treatments. Can you imagine this, ladies? I'm talking to the ladies here. Six months with oil and myrrh. Now, we've got to go out to the store right now, get some oil of myrrh, and six months with sweet spices and perfumes and the things for the purifying of the women. Oh, my. That was some beauty treatments <laughs> a year. All I have to say is, I mean, she was beautiful to start with, but even if she had been ugly, she'd have been coming out okay. <laughs> then in this way, the maiden came to the king, and whatever she desired was given her to take with her from the harem into the king's palace. In the evening, she went, and next day she returned into the second harem, into the custody of of Shah, I can't pronounce this, Shahagaz, I believe, the king's eunuch who was in charge of the concubines. She came to the king no more unless the king delighted in her and she was called by her name. That's very important. The Lord knows you by name, beloved. And now when the turn for Esther, the daughter of Abigail, Ab Abihel, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her as his own daughter, had come to go into the king, she required nothing but what Haggai, the king's attendant, the keeper of the women, suggested. And Esther won favor in the sight of all who saw her. Everybody. She touched everybody. Now, only God could do something like that, beloved. So Esther was taken to King Ahasuerus into his royal palace in the 10th month the month of Tibet in the seventh year of his reign. And the king loved Esther more than all the women, and she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the other maidens. So that he set the royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. And then the king gave a great feast for all his princes and his servants, Esther's feast. And he held, uh, gave a holiday, f holiday or a lessening of taxes uh, to the provinces and gave gifts in keeping with the generosity of a king. And when the maidens were gathered together the second time, Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate. Now Esther had not yet revealed her nationality underscore that. She never told of her people, for she obeyed Mordecai's command to her to fear God and execute his commands, just as she did when she was being brought up by him. So Esther learned very young what obedience was. She learned how to obey authority in her life. Mordecai took her into his home under his roof as a little orphan girl, and he raised her the right way. 
He raised her to honor, authority, and she was taught to do this at a young age. Sometimes, beloved, things happen to us at a young age. We don't see the benefits of till we're much, much older. I can look back in my own life and I can see the way I was raised has really taught me well for the times that I'm living in today. There's just different things I can look back at now and see, you know, what my dad would do and my mother would do and I would, like any other teenager, I would try to rebel, but down in my heart, I knew my dad was looking after me. Are you hearing me? And this was Mordecai. So here we see, or rather, rather Esther, obeying Mordecai. So here we see that the choice of a bride to be queen cannot be done hastily. <laughs> it would take weeks, even months, for all of the provinces to learn of the open competition. This is a competition throughout the whole of Persia. All the participants had to be fair or, or, or beautiful and they had to be virgins. It would seem that it was, kind of, you and I would say it was like a Miss America contest. The girls who won at the local level moved to the county level, then to the state level, and finally the state queens met in the central place for final selection. So she had to go through all of this to get to where she had to go. It's called, and I'm gonna be talking about, again, the law of progression. We all want to arrive, but we don't want to take the steps to get there. So this aim was to select the most beautiful girl in the world, that known world at that time. And she had going to be the queen. After all the eliminating contest, the king would be his own judge in the grand finale. We also have seen the arrival of Mordecai at the beginning of God's favor, showing now in Esther's life. Now, we have a little picture right now of Mordecai, but notice throughout it, it talks about Mordecai the Jew. He's always got the Jew in there. You'll see the words Jew stands out. And what for what happens eventually to the people of Israel, to Esther and Mordecai's people, we know that such words were not words of endearment, but they were rather, they were scorn. It was kind of, oh, that Jew. Mordecai also had royal connections himself in that Saul, the first king of Israel, was the son of Kish the Benjaminite, and Mordecai had also descended from Kish. Mordecai was one of the Jews carried into captivity in the days of Nebuchadnezzar. Others that we know maybe better than the name um, Mordecai would be Ezra, Nehemiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These all came out together. After Cyrus, the king of Persia, allowed Nehemiah to return and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, the people of Israel eventually returned to their own land on a voluntary basis. But Mordecai, among others, elected to stay. Interesting, because we really have no idea what influenced him to make this decision. But in the light of the future events, we know who influenced him. And that goes for you and I, beloved. We might not know why we did what we did or why we made a certain decision, but if it was God, you'll find out sooner or later who made this, the decision. You may have carried it out, but God put it in your heart. Are you hearing me now? We have no idea what happened here, but we just know what the scripture says. Esther's life was now going to turn in to a life filled with favor. Why? As I started to say at the beginning of this message, because all things with God are possible. Nothing's impossible with God. Actually, we see the favor coming forth, but even when she was a little orphan child, God's hand was upon her. He said, you will be with Mordecai, I'll take care of you. It's marvelous to me how God causes his servants to get on so well in difficult situations and brings them out of seemingly hopeless conditions. 
and raises them to the highest powers so that they, his children, beloved, become intimately and ultimately the channels through which he brings through his perfect will. He's got a perfect will for all of our lives and favor for all of our lives. You know, we, we talked about Joseph a wee while back there, but Joseph had the same spirit as Esther. You know, Esther's whole thing was, if I perish, I perish. I'm going ahead of myself. But Joseph was the same way. It didn't matter what happened to him. He was going to serve God. He is an outstanding illustration of this truth. Joseph disliked intensely by his brothers. He escaped death at their hands twice and then sold as a slave into Egypt. That's the end of him, they said. That's the end of his dreams. Who said that to you? Who told you? That's it. It's over. The end of your dreams. What voice said that to you? I can tell you the voice. The voice of your enemy. Because with God, nothing is impossible. The devil's always telling God's people, they can't, they can't, they can't. And God's always saying, you can, you can. You can do all things through me that strengthens you. Hallelujah. So that's what the brothers were thinking. That's the end. His dreams are over. The verdict's been made. We'll get right back now to Jacob. But God's favor. In Egypt... Joseph might have been sold to anyone to be used and abused in many ways. But it was to Potiphar's house he went. Just like Esther was under Mordecai. It was to Mordecai's house she went. See, God had the whole thing planned out. The Bible tells us that God gave Joseph favor with his master. Promotion came fast. When you're in God's time, beloved, things happen quickly. Trust me. Promotions came very fast for Joseph as his abilities were recognized. The same thing with Esther. I just read it to you. Everybody that saw her, she found favor in their sight. It seemed with Joseph that everything was going great. Then came one of those tragedies, beloved, which causes each and every one and within the sound of my voice to know what I'm saying is true. Life happened while we were making our plans. And we're faced with tragedy. We're faced with our knees buckling. We're faced with somebody pulling the carpet out from under us. We're faced with terror. We're faced with a doctor's uh, diagnosis. And we can't believe it. We're faced with unemployment. We're faced with all kinds of things that happen. Your child's sick, your husband, your wife, whoever. You've just been given a pink slip. Well, let me assure you one thing, beloved. You can always get another job somewhere, sooner or later. But when the serious things in life happen that you have no control over, that's when you know where your trust is. Are you hearing me? That's when you cry. Many of us do. Why, Lord? Why? This is what Joseph did. Accused of raping. Circumstantial evidence. No one to plead his cause. He lost everything. And he was banished to jail. But only God knew that Joseph was innocent. But guess what, beloved? He did nothing to save him. Wow. But the vindiction, or vindication rather, of Joseph would be wonderful when it was God's time. See, sometimes things happen, beloved, and we need to walk it through. But I'm here to tell you from experience, since 1977, when I first spoke those words, Jesus, come into my life. 
I want you to be my Savior, and today I'm making you my Lord. Since that day, beloved, I'm here to tell you, God is faithful. There is nothing too difficult for him. And I have been to hell and I've been through high waters. And I can tell you that I can lay in my bed at night and I have zero with the rim off against no one in this life. I hold no grudges. I hold no, no hurts or wounds or anything. It's all gone. But there's been times in my life, beloved, like Joseph, and like you're going to see in a few few weeks and as we go on with this, like Esther, you're, there's been times when I've said, where are you, God? Come on, am I just talking to me here? Where are you? I need to see you. I need to hear you. I need a word from you. As I'll tell you now. You could talk to a thousand people about the Bible, but get one minute alone with God and let him speak and it'll change your life forever. For absolutely forever. Oh, holy. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. So the vindication when it came for Joseph was absolutely incredible. And he would look back, just like you and I. He, will, he would look back and see no matter what happened to him, God's favor was there. And he, like many of us, would be able to say, that's why he was able to say, you thought you planned evil against me, but my God planned it for my good. And just as Joseph, beloved, was the divine instrument in his day, Esther was going to be the divine instrument in her day. And now these day, days of preparation had begun and they were very, very important because it's called the law of progression. And God knows when you're ready. And when you're ready, he knows where you are. All these chosen beauties finally arrived on the stage, this great stage that was set by God. When the king would make his selection and announce to his people his new bride and his new queen. Now, I don't know how you feel when you're reading the Bible, but I picture all of this in my mind, and I can just imagine the activities behind the scenes, getting these women ready. Sometimes you'll see these, um, you know, uh, pageants, Miss Universe or whatever, or Miss America, and you'll sometimes they'll take you behind the scenes and you see them putting on their makeup and all the rest of it. They didn't have a look into what they were doing these days. Uh, believe me, they, the, these, these women were literally gorgeous. <laughs> so you can imagine all that what was going on, but not only behind the scenes of making them beautiful, you can imagine everything that was going on in every little hamlet and village. All these people are, are offering bribes and special favors to this eunuch. You look at my daughter. Get my daughter before Ahasuerus. But this eunuch knew nothing and saw nothing but Esther. Of all the candidates that were in his custody, beloved, all of them, this chamberlain only saw Esther. And he's, she was the only one that he helped to the degree that he did. His preference was seen as he gave her the best. The Bible says the best. But here's the key to Esther's life, just like Joseph, beloved. And it's very important that you hear this. Esther made no effort to win his favor. Oh, glory. He just knew, or rather she just knew, excuse me, that she just had to walk with God. We try to build this thing, get so deep, and so out there, and all God's saying is, 
just a closer walk with me. Get close to me, child. The rest of your problems will disappear. And Esther didn't beg him. Mordecai didn't beg him. Mordecai knew that God was up to something, but he didn't yet know what it was. Oh, it gets exciting, I tell you. Oh, it gets exciting. She made no effort. Why? Because of Proverbs 8.35. She found wisdom and she drew forth favor from the Lord. And when you have favor with the Lord, the Bible says the heart of the king is in his hand and he will turn it whichever way he desires. You don't need nobody else. God will use people all around you to show great favor to you. But it's God's work, not yours. Esther did not make known her people or her kindred. She walked in that wisdom. She knew that Mordecai had instructed her not to. And she wasn't stupid. She knew there's a reason, even although Mordecai didn't know what it was yet. He was obeying God. Sometimes we walk, beloved, we don't know what God's saying, but we just have to trust him. She never told them that she too was Jewish because she obeyed her elders. This verse always impresses me because the thought comes to me, did Mordecai have some consciousness that God was going to use this very unusual situation to expand it for his own glory? I believe there had to have been something there. He had to have seen in Esther something that was really special. She must have shown him as she was growing up wisdom beyond her years and her obedience to her uncle Mordecai. And he must have been sitting there many times. I, I really believe this, that he would sit there and scratch his head and say, I don't get this, God. Anybody here? I don't get your plan yet, but I'm going to do what you tell me to do. I'm going to love people and trust you. I believe that he knew with God, just like Esther knew, that all things are possible to him who believes. That's what this message, the beginning of Esther's life is all about. And you'll find that scripture in Matthew 9, 23. All things, I'm repeating it, are possible to him who believes. So, you'll always find those who refuse to accept the accepted just because it's accepted. Their response to limiting conditions is why not? Instead of, okay, sure, they have human frailties, but the difference is they're determined to walk by faith to the very edge of their potential. And I believe that was Mordecai. He walked by faith through this whole thing. When they get there, they know that God will either put solid rock under them or he'll teach them to fly. It's just that simple. They've tapped into something, beloved. It's called the unlimited power of Almighty God. When did God die and put a human in, in, in charge? When did God have to hawk the pearly gate to supply all your needs? When did God have to chip a piece of gold off of his streets? God is God. May I remind all of us that God is still supreme. Listen to these words. Who through faith... These people I'm talking about, like the Esthers and the Mordecais and you who have been covered with the blood of Jesus and he has placed on you a robe of righteousness. He's been made unto you wisdom, sanctification, 
all of these wonderful things are in your life. Who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gave, and gained rather what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength. Say that with me. My weakness will be turned to strength. Do you believe that? I want you to say it again then. My weakness will be turned to strength. These people became powerful in battle and they did it by faith. Real faith that says, I am what God's word says I am and I can do what God's word says I can do. There is a story that's told. I don't know how much truth is in it, but I could kind of believe it really because it's about a Scotsman. <laughs> Hallelujah, Jesus. <laughs> okay, praise Jesus. Where did I put it? I know I've got it. Somewhere. Well, oh yeah, yeah it's right in front of me. The story is call, c told of a Scottish foreman who worked hard and demanded the same from his men. One day, one of them said to him, Jock, don't you know that Rome wasn't built in a day? To which he replied, I, but I wasn't the foreman on that job. <laughs> Today, ask God to help you overcome your fear. Step out in faith, follow him, for your future depends on it, beloved. And so does your favor with God. Expr he wants to express his favor through you every step of your way, every day of your life. And so, hallelujah. I'm still laughing at, oh, praise God. <laughs> hallelujah. So it's according to the power that worketh in us. According to the power that is work, at work in us. Ephesians 3.20. Do you know what you've got? I want to say something to you this morning, beloved. When you believe in yourself, you will always expect, or you, when you don't believe rather in yourself, you will always expect the worst from yourself. And you'll always expect the worst from others around you. You'll, you'll never focus on a great goal because you'll always be worried about how you look, what others think of you, or whether you're going to fail. You're the only one that can answer. Are you like that? And let's all be honest. We've all been there. If you are, I want you to listen. The Bible tells us in Ephesians 3.20, now to him, you and I, who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to the power that is at work in us. The power that's at work inside of you by the Holy Spirit. That power was inside of Esther. That power was inside of Joseph. That power was inside of, is inside of all of us. Every single one of us. Esther believed that all things were possible. Esther believed that, that, that if, if God was going to make her the queen, there's something more to this God. So we see that Esther did not make known anything that Mordecai had told her not to. And we see that Mordecai stayed very close to the scene. Verse 11 I read to you shows real concern for Esther, possibly agitation as he's going back and forth, back and forth, trying to pick up some vital information of how this young Esther was faring in such a strange country. She had never left home. She's what we would say to, we would say she was wet behind the ears. She had no experience in the world. She would, would have led a very sheltered life. Now she was in her own, she was on her own and, and placed in a very tough situation. How many of you have felt 
on your own and placed in a very tough situation. Well, you do your best and leave God with the rest. That's all he's asking you. And at last we see that Esther's waiting was over. She completed a 12-month preparation. She was soon to see the king. And even more important, he was going to see her. This is the highlight in Esther's life. An amazing day. Wow. Homecoming queen on a national basis. Esther lacked nothing. For each girl had access to every beauty preparation available. Each one of them, she lacked nothing. And she could choose, ladies listen, she could choose whatever clothes and accessories that she wished. Oh, what a day that must have been. I'm sure that most women could have managed this day quite successfully. Imagine your husband or your father letting you loose in the best store in town and saying, the lot, whatever you want, just buy it. Go ahead and take it. Everything you want. I want you looking your best tonight. I'll guarantee you his checkbook would be hurting for the next 10 years. <laughs> Hallelujah. Here she was, Esther, queen for a day. Hallelujah. But she had one thing, beloved. I want you to hear this. That is superior to every beauty aid. She had wisdom, but she had natural beauty. No matter, you can love me, leave me, throw tomatoes, do whatever you like. You can spend a thousand dollars, ladies, on a bottle of oil. But you've either got it or you ain't. Everybody say, I love Pastor Pat. <laughs> she had the basics. And the year of preparation just added to it. Are you hearing me? Now, I'm not saying you don't buy all these preparations. I mean, you want to come to my house. <laughs> I mean, I think sometimes I have more than what Esther put on for a, a year, Whatever. I'm not saying we don't, but there is such a thing as a natural beauty. Amen? And I will say this. If the barn needs painting, paint it. So do whatever you need to look your best. You hear me? Is that okay? All right. Now, <laughs> I really went off on a tangent. So now we're in the store, and she's queen for a day. This natural beauty was what shone through. Most of us, men and women included, we all need all the help we can get. But whatever we get, however fine the improvement, beloved, it can never compare with a natural young beauty. I, I was thinking, and that's within and without, because I believe beauty comes from within. I really do. But I was looking at my little grandbaby this morning, our great grandbaby, and I'll tell you now, when I look at her little face and at all these new babies, just look at any of them, they're all beautiful. But you'll be hard pressed to find one wrinkle on them. Don't you wish you could just say, oh, I wish I had a magic potion to put, so that these children never have to have a wrinkle. But guess what? As long as they live and progress, it's gonna happen. But I looked at that little face and I thought, there's a beauty natural, just a natural beauty. Hallelujah. Esther was not the first candidate that the king had seen, possibly hundreds before her. Many may have stirred him, and some he may have lusted after. Listen carefully. He may have lusted and desired them with great passion, but it's an amazing thing. <laughs> Listen carefully. Because when Esther is brought in, he says, it says rather, the Bible says, the king loved Esther above all the women. It's called God's favor and the king's heart. He didn't lust, he loved. 
And immediately, immediately, he made his choice. He announced his verdict. There's no seat where in the Bible says that Esther was the last one. There could have been many after her. He made his choice, announced the verdict. Esther was a new queen, and yet her nationality was not yet disclosed. I believe God went before Esther just like he does with you and just like he does with me. And I believe that as soon as, as um, the king looked upon Esther, it was like the story of Moses in the basket, you know? And when, when the Pharaoh's daughter saw that baby, the Bible says he was fair, beautiful. And I believe at that point, a couple of angels went up and started to pinch him, pinch him. And any mother wants to hold that crying baby. And I believe that's what happened with King Ahasuerus and Queen Esther. When he looked at that woman, he, I don't believe he saw her beauty. He saw, yes, he saw her beauty, but that wasn't what he saw. He saw something, beloved ladies and gentlemen, that money cannot buy right. and cream cannot make. Right. And God at that moment said to him, she's the one. Just like in your lives. You going for that job interview? For goodness sake, brush your teeth and comb your hair. Put on a nice suit or a nice jacket or a nice dress or whatever. Get your shoulders back. Get your head up. You're a child of the king. And ask God, as soon as that person interviews you, you're having favor. They're going to forget all about the rest. It's yours. No matter where you go, go into the store. Ask God for favor before you go. You'd be amazed. You would be amazed at the favor of God that will come upon your life. But you have to believe it. You, I can get up here and preach till I'm blue in the face, beloved, till I've got no breath left. But unless you become a doer of the word and not a hearer only, it's not going to help you. It's not going to help you. You need to apply what you're hearing in these services. Are you, are you getting anything here? Praise God. Praise the Lord. I have experienced such favor with God in my life. I, I, I can't even express it to you. But I know that 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 it's only God. I couldn't do it. It's him. Every head bowed if we can and every eye closed. Father, I thank you for your son. I thank you for Jesus. I thank you for every person in this room within the sound of my voice, Lord. I thank you, Holy Ghost. I praise you, Holy Ghost. I give you the glory. You're here today and you've never made a decision for Christ. You've never really said, Lord, I want you to be my savior. Perhaps you've listened to this word today and you've said, I, I, want, to, I want to do something with my life. I want to know you, Jesus. That's invitation one. Second invitation is to those in this room that know Jesus. And you say, Pastor, I do know the Lord. But I heard this message and I heard the Holy Ghost. And he said, it's time for me to start believing. It's time for me. If Esther could as a little orphan girl become queen of Persia, how much more does God want to do for his church? So if you're here today and you've never received Jesus, I just, I always like to make this invitation. 
You never know who might slip in the doors that don't know him. So if you're here today, and you say, Pastor, would you pray for me? Would you raise your hand so that I can see if there's any hand anywhere? There is one? Okay, God bless you. Another one? God bless you. God sees your heart today. God knows your heart today. So where you're seated right now, I'm going to ask everyone to pray with me. Can we say this together? Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Today, I receive you as my Savior. And today, I make you my Lord. God bless you. If you've said that prayer for the first time today, welcome to the body of Christ. Welcome to the church of the living God. Welcome to Jesus. And before you leave, our care pastor, Pastor Sandy, will get you some information about the new birth, and she'll give you a little gift, and we, we just welcome you back. You need to grow as a Christian. And now for those of us who are Christians this morning, and you would say, Pastor, I heard that message, and I want to make some changes. As, I, as you said earlier, I'm not, I was never an orphan. I never came through half of what all of these people in the Bible came through. But I want to change. I, I want to apply that, that favor. I want to believe it. And you would say, that's me, Pastor. Would you pray for me? Let me see your hands. God bless you. All over. There are too many hands to count. All over. Yes, I see them all over. God bless you. Just put them back down. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. It's really it's really something when when you make an invitation like that and the cameramen put their hands up. That's really something. God is so faithful. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus. Thank you for everything you've done for me. I am so grateful to you that I am a Christian. I'm so grateful for your word. And I'm so grateful for your favor. And from this day forth, I am going to do the very best I can to apply your favor to my life. And I believe I receive it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Praise God. Well, we'll continue. Are you excited?